today, I get to have a conversation with Sandy Rubin, who is an IGMA fellow since 1989. And I get to talk with her about inexpensive punches, punches that we all have lying around our workroom and how we get to create beautiful arrangements. Thank you, Anne. Before I get to the inexpensive punches, I'm going to talk a little bit about paper because it's a um, vital element in making good flower arrangements. You should not work with printer paper. It's very difficult to use and the paint the flakes off. And so I have students in, invest in a Japanese art paper. Uh, it's a Hiromi paper and it's very, uh, it's not translucent. It, it has a good hand. It, the Japanese paper I like to recommend is Kozoshi Pure White Heavy. And it's $4.50 for a 22 by 36 inch piece. And that works beautifully for miniature flower making. It takes acrylic paint, which I use, such as this in the two ounce bottles, to paint all my papers, except when I'm using fabric. I'd like to have any student who's interested in flower making or might attempt to give it, give it a try at some point to have a good paper. So your flowers will be as good as you can make them and as you like them. The Japanese paper can be purchased at Paper Connection dot com and they they all they have it available now i'm going to talk about inexpensive punches that can be used i'm using green because it shows up well and i'm going to demonstrate with some expensive inexpensive punches now these punches, uh, everyone's seen them. They're the McGill punches. And I got two for $10 on Amazon. And they were a heart and a star, which is all you need to create a rose. I have other more specific punches that I use that are small and fit nicely along the edge of the paper. And they're created by a company called Punch Bunch. And you can buy them online for $4.95. And they have all types of leaf stems and they have a beautiful geranium leaf. And they just have a myriad of designs, leaf, leaf clusters. The, the, the list goes on and on. But all you, all you really need are some basic punches, like a daisy shape, a heart, a star, and maybe 
a leaf cluster, like so, and a circle punch, like this one from McGill, to use for your calyxes and leaf clusters and various things of that nature. You can get along fine with just these particular punches. And again, the McGill punches run about $5 each. Like I said, I got two for 10 on Amazon and they were just what I wanted, a heart and a star, because that's what I use to make a rose. So, I have, and I have lots of punch, inexpensive punches. Now for those who work in smaller scales or like smaller leaves for their particular project that they're working on, there's a company called greenstuffworld.com that has four leaves to a punch. And it, it will work beautifully for small leaves, very tiny leaves on 1 12th scale, half scale. I think they're a little large for quarter scale. But they have all different types and varieties of leaves. These are, these are a good, in, good investment because you can use them on your wire and get all different kinds of shapes. And you can vary the shapes, large and small, and mix them together. So your what's going on in your arrangement does not look cookie cutter or, or straight. Now I mentioned wire. I'm going to talk about wire. I recommend I hope you can see that before it rolls away. Paper covered wire. That's a 28 gauge piece of paper covered wire that has been painted with, again, craft acrylic paint on a cosmetic wedge, which is a small triangular wedge that you use to apply makeup. You can get a bag of those at the dollar store for 99 cents and they work, they work beautifully to paint the wire. I puddle the paint onto the cosmetic wedge and squeeze the wedge over the wire like so. I'm using my fingers to demonstrate because I don't have a wedge here. And I slide up the wire twice. And then I secure the painted wire in what I call a wire holder. It holds the pins that I need to create centers and to create calyxes so I can slide them up the stem. And they're also wonderful for inserting your wire and letting it dry. The drying process for the paper covered wire is not too, too long, it's pretty quick. And the reason that I use the paper covered wire, it doesn't fray as much, it's it's a better scale all the way around. And, and cloth covered wire has a tendency to fray and be too thick. And you can only usually get heavy gauges in your craft stores and such like 18 gauge and uh, 14 gauge and things like that, which are much too large for miniature work. Now I'm going to talk about Another paper that I've used, this is becoming very difficult to get because of the COVID situation. So I, I'm just demonstrating what I did on the paper, which you can do on the Kozo paper as well. 
I started with white, with a white piece of paint paper that had been painted white on both sides. And I actually hang them on a clothesline with clothespins to dry so I can get a lot of paper painted at one time. And I have a setup, one of those retractable clotheslines in my basement where I can clip the paper to the line and have them dry. This particular paper, you can see all the variations in color. It started out white. I took a regular rubber stamp. You can you get the color of your choice. They're they're priced at all all different price levels. You can get them on Amazon. There are scrapbooking stores on the internet that sell various punches and various sizes and colors. This one I painted using a color called rhubarb stalk. And I took another cosmetic wedge and tapped it into the stamp pad. So the cosmetic wedge had a, quite a bit of ink on it. And I just went up and down with the cosmetic wedge. And you'll see I have light spots and dark spots, which is, which is what I want. I, that's the look I want to achieve because it will give a variegated look to your flowers, to roses, to begonias, to peonies, to just about, just about everything. And it also is a very successful paper. I also use an interesting product, excuse me, that's called Japanese flower making fabric. And that, this fabric has an interior sizing so that you can cut it and you can cut it very small and it won't fray as I cut this sort of teardrop shape, which ultimately becomes a calla lily. I'll move this so you can see it better. There's the teardrop shape and there's, there's the calla lily that's finished using, using that teardrop. I use, I use the fabric for certain flowers, such as calla lilies, pitcher plants, and other larger petaled flowers, because you can't punch through this paper. You have to cut it. So I recommend a good pair of scissors that you save just for cutting paper or this sized fabric and it will work it will work beautifully for you the fabric can be obtained on the internet it comes in a large packet like this and here's here's what it's called you get a cotton paper super fine moment cotton fluorescent white and hard. Hard means that the particular sizing is stiffer. I also go ahead and put an extra coat of sizing on this to make sure that it, that it doesn't fray and that it's rigid enough, as you can see, like a paper to Cut, cut the flowers you need, you need or would like to, like to have. You can also experiment using a circle punch to create ruffled flowers, cut out the circles by hand, embellish them any way you want with, with permanent marker, ultra fine point, stamp pads, soft pastels, 
water soluble crayons, anything that that will work. The most econo the most economical is probably the water soluble crayons because the, there's a broad range of color and they're very inexpensive. And that's how I use to color. You can see I've, I've used some spots down here. I've used a permanent marker. And I and this is this is a very small size. That they come even smaller. The micron uh, permanent ink pens makes a zero point point zero zero five point head, and that's what I use most of the time. Here is a water soluble crayon, and what I mean by water soluble is you just I'll rub some on this pad. These are a myriad of tools that you don't have to invest in, but yet they're, they're inexpensive. You will need something to color your petals and leaves besides acrylic paint. And I'm going to get a paintbrush. This is a number 10. flat shader brush, which is available at dicklick.com. And there are various other people who carry small brushes like this. You might try Amazon. You can use, sometimes get a set of them for $10. But I, I invest in good brushes and I get them from Dick Blick. So I have, so I have lots of these. And what I'm going to do is take the flat brush, as you can see, I'm going to dip it in water, blot it a little bit, just a touch on paper towel, and I'm going to smooth out the color. And as you can see, it blends out the color very easily. Continue with this again. So you can get a beautiful blend of color. For a very economical price. And as I said, the color from very the color variation is very broad. So and and they run about two dollars a piece. And you can also buy them in sets, which is a very economical way to get a lot of different colors. That's one of the methods, probably the easiest method I use to color petals. I also, as I said, use permanent markers and pastels and things of that nature to get the effect I'm looking for. I also, getting back to the paper, for some things, I use an Italian crepe paper. And it comes in big rolls. It looks just like the kind like you used to stream, hang for streamers. It looks just like that, but it comes in various colors, which is nice. And I size them with a UV ultra, ultraviolet protectant sizing. And I size both. I size both sides with a foam paper brush. It makes the crepiness relax a little bit. But you can hang it on your on your little clothesline or drape it over something. What get it to dry? It dries relatively quickly. The color does blend itself because it's. 
a simple color process. You're not making the color process, the manufacturer is. So when you brush with the, the ultraviolet varnish, it will fade out some areas and make some areas heavier and blend together. And subsequently when it dries, it makes the paper very rigid. So you can cut them. You can even cut them with these small, I'll tip that that way so, the, so you can see with these small punches. And that's another paper I use frequently because it gives me a very elegant look, a look that I, a look that I like, and it's soft and roughly, and because of the crepiness of the paper, and that works beautifully in flower making. If you order paper, order it on Amazon for the crepe, and it comes in various colors. And it's roughly $5 to $7 a huge roll. And you will have a roll for your entire lifetime. The only color I don't use of the crepe paper is white because the white crepe paper turns translucent when the UV varnish is applied to the paper. So I use some other paper, usually the Hiromi paper, for the effect I want to achieve. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the various kinds of glues you can use. I use any kind of tacky. I use quick dry, you can use regular tacky, which is relatively inexpensive. You can get these at your craft store or again through Amazon. I use two types of super glue to ensure an instant bond on the petals, depending upon what I'm doing. I use a super glue gel which is the Gorilla brand. And I most frequently use the medium thickness Zappa Gap um, uh, instant glue. I use, the, I use these the most. I touch first, I touch a petal first in a dot of white glue and then a tiny touch of Zappa Gap, and it will adhere instantly to your armature or your wire or however you're applying the uh, however you're applying the leaf or flower or flower petal to the stem wire. I also use very frequently, these little bottles of paint, you, I, I fill these myself with Elmer School glue, and it has these removable tips in various gauges that come off, and you can change the gauges on the same bottle of glue to get the effect. This is a 22 gauge uh, needle applicator that I'm using. And what the toothpick is, is I've wrapped around the toothpick some 34 gauge wire. And I use that wire to put it into the tip when I'm not using it to keep the glue from drying out and to keep it flowing easily when you need it. The larger 
applicator tips don't necessarily need the wire. You can use a beading needle or a regular glass head pin or any, anything you want to use to keep the, the glue moist and free flowing. And you should keep the piece in there when you're not using the glue. So the injector needle stays free of clogs. And as I said, I also use Elmer's School glue straight. I use that on the Japanese flower making fabric to keep it from fraying. If I notice a little fray, I'll take a needle tool, which is made very simply. I just went to the craft store, bought some needle tools, and I put white tape, duct tape, on the end of it so I have something to hold on to. And these will, these will fill the larger applicator holes and keep the glue free flowing. And these are also wonderful for adding bits of glue around the edge of particularly the Japanese um, fabric uh, Hiromi paper. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. It was not Hiromi, it's Kozo. And I just dip it into my glue, my Elmer School glue, and go around the edge of the cut shape, whatever, be it a teardrop or a circle or whatever your particular shape may be. And I just take a light amount of glue, which I will demonstrate. And with your beading tool, Go around the particular shape with a light bead of glue just to make sure that the piece will not fray. And I will get my tweezers and move this so you can see it. And you go all the way around the shape. And Elmer's School glue works, works beautifully, or Elmer's Glue All. And you can usually get that pretty inexpensively. You can get it for a dollar a bottle at the dollar store, or you can get it at any craft store or big box store that you frequent. And I've talked about the inexpensive punches. There are other tools used in flower making that are relatively inexpensive because you can make them so. You can invest in what I call this, this foam. It's called McGill flower making foam. And you can buy that on Amazon, or you can get on Amazon small thicknesses of kids' craft foam that they use for making refrigerator magnets and other things. You can get the thin pieces of foam and just cut a larger stack because here. I always work with three in a stack. Oh, I actually have four. So I, I work with three or four in a stack and to get them the proper thickness that you want, which is about an inch, you, you can get the thin foam, which is inexpensive and you know, layer up to 10 pieces. 
and I've had these a long time. They last. They last a long time. They're you know, they're uh, a good. These McGill flower making pads are a good investment because you don't have to hunt for the pieces of craft foam, which are very difficult to obtain these days because of companies going out of business and the COVID situation. Other tools that I use that are most important are tweezers and a good pair of scissors. I'll do this this way. There's my tweezers. You can see they're very sharp, very fine. That is the best investment you can make, not just for miniature flower making, but for everything you want to do pertaining to miniature. And these are, these are really excellent. And the company where I get them is called technatool.com. And they start in price, all ranges from as little as $3 up to $250 for a tweezer. I can't stress enough the importance of a good tweezer because it's going to help you pick up ultra tiny pieces, hold things, the fine points, make it easier to hold little tiny pieces. It's the, it's the best investment you can make. Now I have a specific pair of scissors that I use only for cutting paper leaves. That's all I use it for because most of, most of my flowers are cut by punch. There are some I still do by hand. So I use these scissors and you can invest in a good pair of scissors at Amazon, craft stores, any big box store, you can, you can whatever you frequent and invest in a good pair of scissors. They will help you in the long run to cut flower making fabric as well as to cut the Japanese Kozo paper. If you have trouble getting the Kozo paper, you can go to a company that I've mentioned before called Dick Blick, and they have various art papers that you can get very reasonably, but get a light weight paper, something like an 80, 80 pound paper or a hundred pound paper or 110, 110 is very good. Do not buy watercolor paper. That consistency is like using cardstock and it's just too thick. The punches will not go through the paper and it's just not suitable. So avoid watercolor paper. And for some things like calyxes and um, wrappings of buds on flowers, I use good old fashioned tissue paper that I just buy at whatever store, big box store, craft store, Amazon, whatever. This is a natural color uh, tissue paper. And I like the, nat the natural color because it works better with the coloring process that I'm using to create calyxes and flower ovaries and various growths. 
and this is this is very economical. I think I paid 99 cents for a full pack and that'll last me a lifetime. Let's see, other tools. Get my scissors out here. I'll keep my tweezers so you can see them. There's my tweezer head and point. I use eyeshadow sponges to rub on pastels as well as rubber stamping. And I use them with discretion depending upon the look I want to achieve. With soft pastels, you can get a variety of different types. There are pan pastels, which are extremely soft, and others that come in stick form, which you can scrape with a razor blade and get uh, a little pile of color and draw from that rather than rubbing your eyeshadow applicator on the piece of pastel. And the same, the same goes for the other type of eyeshadow applicator. I use these a lot. And of course, toothpicks. You can't be without those. You can't have enough. And for what I call my, my glue holder, let's say, I'm using an old fashioned cottage cheese lid, and I collected a bunch of 33 millimeter canisters, and I use the canister caps or other small caps that I buy from various suppliers in bulk for myself as well as teaching purposes. And I squirt the Zappa Gap glue in this gray cap so that it doesn't spread all over. And then I'll spray next to it. Um, I'm, forgive me, I won't spray. I'll squeeze out some tacky glue, or if it re requires straight, El straight Elmer's glue. And, and I work from this angle. I take a petal, I dip it first in a tiny touch of the white glue, and then an even tinier touch of the Zappa Gap. You only need one or two drops of Zappa Gap to get it to, to be on the, on the end of the petal and attach it to your stem or whatever armature you're using to get the, to get the petals secure. The mixture of those two glues give you an instant bond and can be used in other areas of miniatures, but I don't recommend it for wood. It just doesn't work as well. And I have a small scissors. You can even use an embroidery scissors or a manicure scissors, as long as it's new and stays sharp, because you can do fringing, you can cut uh, small areas away from a uh, petal if you want to change the shape. You can get into a floral arrangement and cut away things if you so desire, if you cut away too much uh, foliage or whatever whatever you're using as filler for your flower arrangement these work beautifully because the point gets into that arrangement and works really beautifully i use 
little medicine cups for water because they're economical and they're easy to store, but you can use any kind of plastic cup to hold your water for cleaning your paintbrushes and maybe a separate container of water for blending uh, water soluble crayons, et cetera. So I, in I invest in these just because they don't take up much room. And I also use them in my teaching. So there, get them to stand. There, there they are, that's what they look like. And they're, they are not medical cups. That means they have not been sterilized for, for medical use. They are just straight little cups. You don't have to invest in the sterilized cup. There's no need. Now, what I'm going to show you, move this out of the way, is my wooden flower holder. It has six spools glued to it with any wood glue, tacky glue, any, any white glue will, will do beautifully. And on the bottom, I'll move these things. On the bottom, I have attached two tire weights. And I got these in a large volume from Amazon. And they're self-adhesive and they stick right on and it weighs your spool holder down so it doesn't tip if it's nudged or hit or somehow moved in any way. It stays pretty solid and Anything that you have in it, if it fell, wouldn't be all over your pads or your paper or anything else that you may be working on. And I make these myself. They're very inexpensive. You know, jumbo craft sticks are not expensive. And you can also get a small bag of spools, maybe 10 or 20. I use six per spool. You can use you can use five if you like and have a couple of these because it helps to dry and to have something to dry your flowers. Now to go back to the wire for a minute and my other needle tools, this item that I have on a wooden base, small wooden base that I bought in bulk from Amazon and this is actually, the blue is actually a swim noodle that I cut with a small saw and glued to the wooden base. When you're done painting your wires, remember you're using the cosmetic wedge and running the wire twice through the wedge to get the color, you just insert it forgive my fingers, into the swim noodle, into the, as I call this a wire holder, and the wires stay secure and, and they dry. You can, see, you can see wires wiggling and jiggling. I also have a place to hold my needle tools. I use a, a record, whatever I need. I use a tea pin, I use a corsage pin, I use a quilting pin, I use glass head pins, I use beading needles, whatever I need to make a, make a calyx, make something run up a stem. Secure, um, add, a, add Elmer's glue to the edge of a petal and if I vary the pins based on the size of the wire. Now I'm gonna take a, 
a piece of wire and go back to that for a minute. There's my paper cover florist wire. This is a 28 gauge piece. That's what I use the most. 30 is a little too wiggly. And the others, depending upon the flower, I will use uh, a heavier gauge wire. Now with this paper covered wire and a cloth covered wire as well, the higher the number, the finer the gauge. So 30, I believe now is the finest gauge you can get. This is 28, they go 26, 24, 22, and so forth. And I always paint every wire, whatever, whatever I'm doing, even if I'm making leaf clusters that won't show, I paint every, every wire because I get the color I need for the arrangement. And even the paper wire is slightly fuzzy. It, ha it has a, a texture to it. And by painting it, I get rid of that texture and have a smooth, what I, what I refer to now as a stem. This is a stem with a center for a calla lily on it which I made earlier and let dry in my wooden flower holder. If you have to trace anything on Japanese flower making fabric, use a sharp number two pencil and trace very lightly the pattern onto the fabric securing to the back of the pattern a piece of double stick tape so it will hold to the fabric and not slip as you're drawing around it. And when you draw around a pattern, you might see little edges you know, of darkened pencil. And what, if you do, Invest in an art eraser. Those are very inexpensive as well. And erase any pencil lines that you that remain on your pattern so it won't look gray or, or dusty or dirty. I'm just running an eraser over this to show you how it works. And because the Japanese fabric has been sealed it doesn't fray. I use paper plates, just plain old inexpensive paper plates to store petals and to place things on and to use as trash tray. When I'm done with, let's say, here's a particular eyeshadow brush that I've used green on so I'm and I only get one application of color on these so I toss them away. You can get those very economically at Amazon as well. Most of the materials I've shown to you you can get through Amazon or your various big box stores or particularly your craft stores. I buy the paper covered wire from Dragonfly International. I think everyone might be familiar with that company. They carry a variety of things, laser cut kits and flower making supplies, etc. And you can get the cloth covered wire from them. It's a bundle is $15 in any particular gauge. And then there is 200 pieces in the, pun, in the bundle. So you'll have more than enough, more than enough to use. One, pa one package is more than enough. Now for shaping petals, which is the most important thing that I do, 
when I'm when I'm working on flowers. In order to shape the petals, that is, give them some dimension, some depth, I use a ball stylus tool. They're all usually two-ended, and they have various sizes of ball at the ball at the end of them. I have I have four different sizes from very fine to medium to very large. This happens to be a medium size that I'm showing you. There's the larger end, there's the smaller end. And what you do, I'm gonna take this Japanese fabric piece and I'm just gonna roll the ball stylus. Let me move this over so you can see. I'm using the fabric you roll the ball stylus around the piece to get shape and dimension. It works beautifully on the particular paper you're using. It's very yield, the paper is very yielding to the ball stylus tool. This is again one of the most important things you'll need. If you can't afford or don't wish purchase ball stylus tools, you can use an empty ballpoint pen and that will work just as well. And if you're not interested in purchasing any type of craft foam, what you can use is a washcloth put in a Ziploc bag and punch a few holes in it so that all the air is out. And you can shape your petals with a, your ball stylus tool or empty ballpoint pen on, on this washcloth. That will work well for you also. And then I use various things like rulers, and double stick tape to secure petals to pieces of cardboard so they don't slip as I hand color them. And those, you know, you can cut apart a box and have a piece of corrugated board. And, and double stick tape is readily available at Amazon or any of the uh, big box stores. Now, ar arranging your flowers to life. That's probably the biggest mistake that people make when they're arranging their flowers. I'll tilt this this way so you can see it. I bend every petal that I use. That to me is paramount. It doesn't give a cookie cutter look. It gives an element of nature, of actual plants, of, of life in the flower. That's why I bend every every petal or shape it as I use as I use it. That is, that is probably the most important thing you can do to give your flowers life. Shape your leaves, you can curl your leaves with a ball stylus, you can hand cut leaves by using a long strip of paper and just and just cut, cutting you can use a piece of paper like this this is some of the kozo paper and just cut and I'll cut a strip of this now my 
Now my petal is going to be no longer than the piece I cut, obviously. I'm going to put my magnifiers down. And I'm going to cut at an angle, a slight angle. And then I'm going to go to the corner that I just cut. If I can show, there we go. And I'm going to go around in an arc of the opposite direction. And I have a cut leaf. And you can shape these with a ball stylus, with your tweezers. You can use a wooden dowel to shape them. Just about any tool will work. You can even, I just dropped it, I'm sorry. You can even use your fingers to bend them or twist them. And that's what I do with my leaves. I bend them and I twist them and I try to give them as much life as they can. That's the, that's the, the best tips I can offer on giving your arrangements life. Shaping each petal and flower will give you the ultimate look that you want. Thank you for listening to my flower making video. I appreciate your time and your interest, and I hope you have a wonderful day.